us together with love There is only one God There is only one King There is only one body That is why Good morning and welcome to worship at St. Andrew Christian Church. We're excited you've joined us today as we celebrate God's presence, as we seek to strengthen who we are as followers of Christ. A few things you need to know as we share in our worship service together. First, on our church website, there is the online worship tab. If you click on that online worship tab, you will find below that, you will find the link to the worship bulletin for today. You can either print that off or have that visible on an electronic device. It allows you to follow along the service of worship today. It also has the words to the hymns that will be sung throughout the service. We encourage you to participate as much as possible. Uh, as we are social distanced, it allows you to, to connect and have this be as close to worship as we can make it together as a community. Secondly, each week we participate in communion. and. Chuck Pickrell is our facilitator and leader at our table today, and he will invite you to share in communion. So please gather communion supplies so when that time comes in the service, you'll be ready to share in communion together as a community of faith. Finally, we have been lighting an oil lamp on our table. The oil lamp has been a symbol for us during this time of pandemic, of lives that have been lost, of people going through hardship. We have lit this candle for our black community as we are struggling with matters of racism and systemic racism in our country. We continue to, to light this candle as a symbol of hope, as a symbol of compassion, as a symbol of light all around us, that the darkness does not win, that lightness shines even stronger than the darkness. So our prayers, our support, our encouragement is lifted for all of those who have times of struggle and need. We are glad you're here. Let us prepare our hearts and minds to be in a spirit of worship together.
Good morning again, and welcome to St. Andrew Christian Church. Even though we continue to have to meet separately, we are together in our hearts. If you would get your mobile device out uh, and just text a greeting to somebody that you care about, um, it is Father's Day, so go ahead and send a greeting of fathers, whether it be a biological father, an adoptive father, a mom who acts like a father, an uncle, anybody that takes care of you or someone you love the way a father would. And may the peace of God be with you all. Good morning. It is good to know that you are out there, even though I can't see you right now. In a couple of minutes, you're going to hear Pastor Chris read today's Bible story, but I'm going to read just a little bit of it so that we can talk about it. It's in one of those letters that we've been talking about that was written to the different churches. And so this one is written to a church in a town called Colossia. Here's what it says. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. And then a couple verses down, it says, above all, like most importantly, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. So did you know that the Bible talks about clothes? Did you catch that? It says, clothe yourselves, like put on clothes of kindness or humility or patience or love. So like always, I have questions about the scripture. So I'm trying to figure that out. Like what would it mean to be clothed with kindness or love? And then I remembered I have a shirt. This says love, 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 love. So now that I have on the love shirt, now that I am clothed in love, do you think that's what God was talking about or what the letter writer was talking about in that letter? Like, is this what I need to do? So does it matter then what else I do? Like if I have this shirt on and I'm clothed in love but I'm mean to someone, is that okay? I'm guessing if you were here sitting in front of me, you'd kind of roll your eyes at me and go, no, no, that's not okay, right? We know that's not okay. So it's a really big hint, right, that what that means is, I think it's about how we act, right? Whether we have on a shirt that says love or not, we have to act in loving ways. So we've talked about a lot of loving ways over the last few weeks. I mean, we started out talking about one way to show that we love people is by staying at home. So we help to keep this disease from spreading. And we've talked about Black Lives Matter and how some of you had signs saying that and that people were working to make things more fair and that was a way of showing love and about how we need to learn more about that and educate ourselves. Last week, Stacy talked about how listening to people is a really great way to show love. So today, I want to talk to you about another way, because this weekend is World Refugee Day. And so it's a day when we try to think about and pray about and help and learn more about refugees. So a refugee is somebody who has been forced to leave their home country because it wasn't safe for them to be there. So maybe there was a war going on, or maybe there's a not enough food there. Um, there could be a lot of reasons why people have to leave their home and move to a completely new country. And they usually have to do it in kind of a hurry, so it's not like they can even take all their stuff. So it's a pretty hard life. And we try to welcome refugees into our community. And there's a lot of ways that we can do that. And so we especially want to talk about those today since it's World Refugee Day. So one of the big things we do at St. Andrew is we've made friends with Swadit and his family and they're refugees, but they're also farmers. And so every Sunday, even now, every Sunday, they come and they have vegetables on our patio that they sell to people. So we help support their farm and help support them. And there's other churches that are doing that too. 
We work with Catholic charities, and so sometimes that might mean we help teach someone English who doesn't know English very well. Um, there's all kinds of things that can be done, and we send our money to Week of Compassion, which we've talked about before, and they help refugees all over the world. So there's lots of big and little ways that we can help refugees, but maybe one of the most important things is to learn about refugees, and that helps us know uh, what might be a good way to help. So I'm going to give you an assignment because I'm going to tell you there are millions of refugees in the world, but you could go to Google and find out how many million refugees there are. You could find out in the world and even just in Kansas or in the United States how many refugees there are. And then remember that more than half of those millions of refugees are children. So lots of good ways that we can show love to refugees. So that would be a good thing to try and learn more about this week. Let's say a prayer. Dear God, thank you for all the ways that you give us that we can show love to other people. Thank you for binding us together in your perfect love and help, that, help us to share that with everyone we know. Amen. We now have the opportunity to pray together for each other and for the world at large. Uh, if you have something that's on your heart or your mind, um, feel free to give that up to God as we begin our time of prayer with a moment of silence. Will you be in prayer with me? Loving God, we come to you asking for help. Help us to live into the love that you sent Jesus to share with us. Help us to live out who we already are, to be compassionate towards others who have different struggles. Help us to be kind to those who can't offer anything in return, and to be humble and realize life is about more than our own individual experiences. Help us to be gentle instead of harsh, and to be patient instead of easy to anger. Help us to forgive everyone, not because they deserve it, but because we received it from you when we did not deserve it. Help us to love in every situation because love is who you are and it's what you do. Help us to let peace have the final say in our souls. Help us to find reasons to be thankful in every situation. Help us to open our ears, our eyes, our hearts, and our minds to you as we pray the words Christ taught us saying, our Creator, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture text today comes from the book of Colossians in the New Testament, chapter 3, verses 12 through 17. Listen so that by faith you may hear God's word for you this morning. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another. If anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other just as the Lord has forgiven you. So you also must forgive. Above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in the one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Teach and admonish one another in all wisdom, and with gratitude in your hearts, Sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. May we pray together. 
Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable to you, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Choices, decisions, we make them all the time. Make them more than we maybe realize we do. One of the earliest decisions we make every day when we get up is, what will I wear today? What's the weather like outside? What am I supposed to do today? Where will I be today? Do I put on grungy clothes and go mow the yard? Do I put on a suit and go to a wedding? Do I wear a tie or some formal attire for work? What do I need to volunteer? Do I wear something casual with my friends? Or do I just stay home in my pajamas? But we all have choices of what we're going to wear on any given day. Now, I must admit that with this choice of clothing, we find ourselves in a privileged place to be able to make so many choices about what we wear. Many places in the world don't have such a choice as we do. But it is a decision we have to make every day in the context and the place in which we live. As I was thinking about clothing, it made me think of our Colossians passage in this chapter 3. One of the early things we read as I read that passage for us today was clothing ourselves with certain qualities of the faith. Clothe yourself with compassion. Clothe yourself with kindness or humility or meekness or patience. And what we find later in the passage, above all, clothe yourselves with love. The author of Colossians was trying to communicate to that early forming community in Colossae what it means to take on the identity as a follower of Jesus. They were early in their journey, early in their believing of this way, And this letter was an encouragement for them of how to do that in the context in which they lived. Chapter 3, if some Bibles have little subheadings to them, the subheading of chapter 3 is new life in Christ. What it means to, to take on this identity as Christian. In that community in which the receivers of this letter lived was a multicultural, multi context environment. And as new followers of Jesus, they would have found themselves a minority voice in their community. And they're trying to figure out, how do I be this person, this new person in this context, which I've already lived. I'm going to be someone new in terms of how I speak and how I behave compared to what I was before I believed these things. And the author of Colossians uses the metaphor of clothing to help them discern what it is they're to do in their life. He says, imagine yourself putting on garments, garments of compassion and garments of kindness. And when you put on these garments, they will help shape who you are and how you're to live in connection to others in the world. They were going through a process of discerning their identity. It made me think of theologian Catherine Tanner, who is an excellent author on theology and its relationship to culture. In her book, Theories of Culture, she talks about three distinct ways in which the religious community relates to the culture in which it's in connection with. The first way that a religious community interacts with culture is what I would call a hard line of separation, where the religious community wants no influence No way in which the outside culture impacts the religious community at all. There is a kind of a protective veil around the religious community. No outsider is going to tell us how to think, how to believe, how to behave. And so there is that way of thinking about it. She says a second way of thinking about faith communities and culture is almost the opposite of that. Instead of a hard line of separation, there's no line of separation, almost to the point of culture and religion become indistinguishable to one another. It's hard to know where religion ends and culture begins, or culture ends and religion begins. 
And she would argue there is a third alternative, a third way in which religious communities and culture relate to one another. And she would say it's a porous boundary, that information flows back and forth between the religious community and the culture, that the religious community, as it moves through that porous boundary, actually impacts and shapes the culture in which that religious community lives. And yet at the same time, the culture moves to that porous boundary and has an impact on how the religious community thinks about itself and responds in its current context in which that community lives and breathes. It's important to know that the church is always to maintain a sense of being relevant to the culture in which it's called to serve that there is a listening, a paying attention to, an investment in the culture in which the church is called to serve. And just as we are being attentive, that gradually the church makes its own strides of impact in the culture, changing the context, one person, one family, one community at a time. So I bring us back to our Colossians text this imagery of clothing, of putting on traits of faith. And the author is telling us not to think of these traits of compassion and kindness and humility and meekness and patience and love as simple conveniences. Well, oh, maybe today I'll try out love and see how that works in the community today. Maybe tomorrow I'll try this humility garment and see how well, if that doesn't go well, I'll try kindness the next day. And that's not really what the author's intent is in this passage of clothing. It says, once you put on these garments of faith, they are meant to be permanent garments. These garments, these words, these traits, these values, these foundational pieces of the Christian faith become the lens by which we live our life out in the world. We don't just, well, I'm done with love today. I'm done with kindness today. Once we place those mantles and garments of faith upon our shoulders in our life, it becomes embedded in who we are. These qualities we read about in Colossians are not something that we do. It is something we do, but more importantly, it's something that we are, something that we embody in how we share our lives with others. If there's any word I would think of to kind of capture much of what this passage from Colossians talks about, it's conviction that we are convicted, that we believe we have within our heart and soul and being, this is who God calls me to be, and I will live this with every fiber of my being in the world. And we all have our different feelings of what conviction can be like and what it means for us. I'll give you an example for me. In my pocket, I have a little pocket cross. And sometimes people think these are hokey little things to put in your pocket. You can pick them up at little stores here and there. It's usually at the counter. Uh, But this one was given to me on the day of my ordination. January 21, 1996. It's a substantial one. It's not just a, a flimsy little cross. It's a substantial little silver cross. I have kept this cross in my pocket since 1996, since the day it was given to me. It's in my pocket. Sometimes it's accompanied by some change or keys, but when I reach into my pocket, I can feel the edges of that cross. I can feel the shape of that cross. And it's this constant reminder to me when my hand goes into my pocket, and hands go in pockets all the time. You're talking to someone, visiting with someone, your hand goes in your pocket. It's a constant reminder that I have mantled myself with my faith, with my belief in Jesus Christ. It's not something I check at the door. It's not something I lay down and do something else for a while and pick it back and put it on my shoulder again. It's something that I have been called to do with every day of my life. And I think, well, I'm convicted. I'm going to do what I can today. There was an author that once said, the Christian person will do the best they can with what they have, tell others to do the same, and leave the results in God's hands. I try to look to people that whose conviction of their Christian faith 
inspires me of my own convictions. One of those Christian people is Dietrich Bonhoeffer, an author I've mentioned before. When I think about Dietrich Bonhoeffer and his life, his writings, his belief, but more importantly, his convictions, I am inspired. He was arrested in 1943 and put into Nazi prisons and concentration camps for his own plotting to rid the world of Hitler. When he was in prison, he is known for his letters from prison. And you can buy the book and read some of his letters. But you can read about other books that he wrote, The Cost of Discipleship, Life Together, and another book called Discipleship. All his books had to do with action and response in the world. If you read through some of the letters from prison, you would discover that there is one phrase that says, we're not merely waiting and looking on. That's not Christian behavior. He says in the letter, Christian behavior is responding with compassion and action in the world. The church is not the church, he says, unless the church is responding to the needs of those around us. It was said of Bonhoeffer when he was in prison for that two-year period he was imprisoned, that every day when his morning began, he would read and meditate on scriptures and say a prayer. When he got to the end of his day, he would meditate on scriptures and pray. There was an intentionality that his life, the alpha and the omega of his day, was shaped by scripture and prayer. He was convicted and to be continually reminded that he had put on garments that would not come off his shoulders, garments that would not leave his soul, garments that would not inhibit him from the words he was called to say when it came to matters of justice and people's needs in the world. In 1945, he was killed at the ripe old age of 39. I just kind of take a breath. 39. Ten years younger than me. And the impact he had on the world because he was convicted in his faith. This is what God calls me to do. At the concentration camp where he was killed, there is a plaque that sits there. He and others were all killed on the same day, but there is a plaque that says, not in English, of course, but it says, in resistance against dictatorship and terror, willing to give one's life for freedom, justice, and humanity. There's a little cross on the plaque, and inside the cross, I was looking at the plaque. It has 2 Timothy 1.7. For God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, but rather a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. There was no cowardice in Bonhoeffer. Convicted of his faith, the moment he said yes to Jesus, those garments stuck to him as close as anyone. And we can think of so many people that were convicted in their faith. Think of Paul and his influence of writers that wrote Colossians. I think of the women at the tomb and the conviction. They didn't just stroll back to the disciples. They ran with haste. Guess what we know? Guess what we're going to celebrate? And then the disciples were convicted. I think of Martin Luther King Jr. I think of Mother Teresa. I think of today, this weekend, we've heard the words of William Barber, who has stood up for the poor people's campaign, and for blacks, and for people marginalized, and people on the edges. He's convicted. He's wearing the garments of faith and says, my life will matter. All of these lives will matter.
and how easy it is to pick up the Bible and read Colossians chapter 3 and open up verse 12. Beloved, clothe yourselves with these garments. And we can think to ourselves, oh, how that's such a sweet, gentle thought. It's much deeper than that. And the passage is not just pointing out other people that are convicted that inspire us. That passage is for you and for me. How are we convicted? How are those garments of faith grafted into the very fiber of our soul when we get up in the morning? We have all kinds of decisions to make. And yes, one of the decisions is, what am I going to wear today? The well, Colossians reminds us that decision's already been made when we said yes to Jesus. Those garments are already there. Are we convicted enough to embody those words in the world we are called to save, to serve, to love, to care for? The garments of faith are there. Do people see them? Do people witness them in you? I hope so. I hope so. Amen. gather at this table, it's important for us to remember why we're here, and that is to celebrate the relationship that we have with Jesus. Jesus didn't do this with uh, just anybody. He did this with misfits, the downtrodden. Jesus built purposeful and loving relationships with the other. And in the world that we're living in today, we find that there are an awful lot of people who uh, are identified as the other. So when we come to this table and we share in the bread, we should remember who we're doing this for and who we're doing this with. Um, when Christ broke bread with his friends and loved ones, he did so with love for every person. And he blessed that bread and he broke it saying, this is my body, which is for you. And then he poured a cup of wine and said, this represents my blood, which is also for you. As so often as you drink this cup, 
and eat this bread. Do so in remembrance of me. Feel free to partake of your elements, whatever they may be, and know that you are sharing in communion with all. Where charity and love prevail, there God is ever found, brought here together by Christ's love. By love are we thus bound. With grateful joy and holy fear, God's charity we learn. Let us with heart and mind and soul now love God in return. Forgive we now each other's faults as we are fallen. each other well in Christian holiness. Let strife among us be unknown. Let all contention cease. Be God's the glory that we seek. Be ours God's holy peace. Let us Recall that in our midst dwells God's begotten Son, as members of His body joined, we are in Christ made one. No race or creed can love exclude, if honored be God's name, our family embrace creator is the same. We are so glad you've worshipped with us today at St. Andrew Christian Church. Uh, a few things before we reach the end of our service. Our website and our social media outlets that we have through the church uh, highlight many of the ways that we can be involved and continue to do ministry together. There are Zoom calls of ministry groups and study groups, and please take advantage of looking at all those social media outlets to learn more about how you can be connected to the ministry of this church. I would like to highlight one thing. For the last several weeks, we have, been, we have put together a social justice response team to anti-racism. Each week in our Thursday communique, our connection, we are providing some action items, things you can do, things you can learn, things you can watch. Please uh, take advantage of those opportunities to plug in and make a difference in our local community. Glad you've been with us and look forward to the next time we can be in worship together at St. Andrew. May the God of peace, the love of Christ, and the power of the Spirit be with you as you mantle yourselves with the garments of faith, as you go out into the world to serve with peace and grace. Amen.